at this point we have three laws that are empirical. Somebody tell me what empirical means. Yes. <coughs> Arrived at by experiment or experience or in some way uh, that you uh, observe it. Okay? Now, this means that you go in the laboratory and you make measurements and you get the empirical uh, mass laws out of it. So the question is, why do these laws exist? And the answer to that question started uh, to develop as far back as the Greeks and probably further back. Uh, and the fellow whose picture here is John Dalton. Uh, he is the guy who's given credit for saying the same thing that a lot of other people did in a little better way, a little bit more clear way. And uh, he produced a simple atomic theory uh, that has four postulates to it. And it is the basis for our initial understanding of these mass laws, the empirical mass laws. You've seen these before. Uh, the first one indicates that all matter is composed of atoms. And these atoms are too small for us to measure directly. Uh, and that the atoms themselves can't be created or destroyed. OK? So whatever atoms are present in the sample will continue to be present in the sample if we cause a chemical change to occur. All those same atoms will be there, but they may be in different compounds. Now, atoms of a particular element can't be converted into atoms of a different element. Now, this has a um, uh, limitation to it. As far as John Dalton knew in terms of chemistry, that was the case. We know today in nuclear physics uh, that some elements spontaneously change into other elements. And other elements can be changed by bombarding them with uh, subatomic particles or other interesting things. We're not talking about that. We're talking about simple chemical reactions here. Uh, and those chemical reactions aren't able to convert atoms of one element into atoms of another. Uh, the third one that he postulated here was the atoms of a particular element are all identical in mass and other properties are, and all of these are different from atoms of other elements. He didn't quite get this one right. and We'll talk about why he didn't uh, a little bit later. Uh, there are actually some potential differences between the atoms of an individual compound that he didn't know about. The fourth one is uh, the one about chemical combination, and that is that compounds result from the chemical combination of a specific ratio of atoms of different elements. Now, he had the advantage of knowing about the law of definite composition. And it is obviously that uh, that this, this fourth uh, postulate uh, refers to. Okay? Now what I'd like to do is to go through and relate um, the mass laws, each of the three mass laws, to his theory so that you can see how the theory explains what goes on uh, in the operation of the mass law. Okay? So uh, let's start with... Uh, mass conservation. And what we said in mass con conservation was the mass of the reactants equal the mass of the products. And you can interpret that through Dalton's uh, postulates here. Uh, we know that atoms, according to Dalton, using chemical means, can't be created or destroyed by postulate one. And by postulate two, they can't be converted into other types of atoms. So each type of atom has a fixed mass, and it's going to end up, however many of that type of atom present in the beginning is going to be present in the end, because they can't be created, destroyed, or converted. So all the mass is there, all the atoms are there, so all the mass is there, and the mass doesn't change. So that's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, if you accept Dalton's uh, views on this, uh, it's pretty easy to 
see how they would result in mass conservation. Questions on that? Okay. What about definite composition? A compound is essentially a combination of a specific ratio of different atoms by postulate four, and each of those atoms has a particular mass by postulate three. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we have here is a circumstance where if you have a set ratio of the atoms of, of different atoms, A, B, C, whatever they are, in a compound, and this is in every sample of that compound, then definite composition follows from specific ratio and each atom having a fixed mass. Okay, if you analyze a compound, you're always going to find the same atoms in there and the same ratio of those atoms. So that will result in definite composition. Okay? We'll wait for you to answer the phone. Okay. What about the law of multiple proportions? How do we handle that? Um, Again, we're thinking about compounds of atoms A and B and uh, elements A and B and cases where there's more than one AB compound, all right, uh, two or more. In that case, the um, easiest way to imagine this is that the ratio of atoms in the different compounds is, is different, that is to say, uh, we could have um, a simple case like carbon oxide 1 and carbon oxide 2 as follows. Suppose carbon oxide 1 has one oxygen per carbon atom, and um, that would mean the ratio of oxygen to carbon atom is just uh, the ratio of the mass of one oxygen atom uh, to the mass of one carbon atom. Why this shows... Uh, uh, oxygen to be smaller than carbon, we'll get to later. Uh, it does not refer to the mass. Okay, and then if we compare that to carbon oxide 2, if carbon oxide 2 simply had two oxygen atoms per carbon, then it would follow immediately that the oxygen mass to carbon mass ratio in carbon oxide 2 would be twice as great as the oxygen mass to carbon mass in carbon oxide 1. Two oxygen atoms have a mass twice as much as one oxygen atom. They're both compared to one carbon atom, and therefore uh, the law of multiple proportions just reflects the fact that compounds form atom by atom. Okay, we may not be able to see it in the laboratory, but if we make if we take carbon monoxide and we burn it in oxygen, it's a fair fuel, kind of toxic, but uh, what really happens here in this reaction is at the atomic level. And the compound's composition is best viewed at the atomic level. And when you do it, you can see why the oxygen-carbon ratio in carbon oxide 2 should be twice as great, 2 to 1, as carbon oxide 1. 